Well, I think um, what I'm trying to say is, if we're a land that in God we trust, and Jesus says, let the children come to me, wouldn't you agree that we need to open our arms to Mexico? No. What you're about to see is an interview with Thomas Sowell after the release of his book, Migration and Cultures. What's great about this interview is he takes live caller questions, some of the burning questions you've had about the immigration debate, and he answers them. Some of the things like the efficacy of building a wall is covered. Um, What Thomas Sowell has discovered through his research, this is a very complex issue. There are no simple answers, and he gets into detail about that, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy that in his deep level of thinking and study on this issue. I have also included at the end of this video the preface to the audiobook to whet your appetite. I'll also have a link in the description to the full content of the audiobook, which I know you will enjoy. Okay, here we go. Migration is as old as mankind. Throughout history, people have moved in order to fill some social or economic void. That certainly has been the case in the United States, but is it still the case today? Thomas Sowell joins us this evening to help us understand how migration has worked in the past and why it may become a relic of a bygone era. There are no more unsettled continents waiting for humans to populate them. No new lands where people can shed the social and cultural baggage of the old world and start fresh. And yet, more people are trying to move in search of better opportunities than ever before. This book is a remarkable piece of research into why and how human beings have migrated in the past. And what about the present, and especially our future? Is the experience of the past, in this case, a reliable compass for the future? Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. This book is really quite an achievement in tracing the history of migrations throughout the world. What would you say is the most important lesson it teaches us as we debate the issue today? Well, first of all, it it says that there is no such thing as immigrants in general, that there are immigrants from different places with radically different skills, that every group has a very pronounced pattern, has a pronounced pattern of skills. Uh, If you look, for example, among the Germans, you find them brewing beer in Germany and the United States and Buenos Aires and uh, Australia. Uh, You find them uh, in... uh, you know, making lenses in Germany and here and other places. Uh, you find people settling. They don't even settle at random. The lady mentioned that how it is a Central American community in Washington. That is very typical. Uh, people who move from Italy to Australia do not move from Italy in general to Australia in general. They'll move from one town in Sicily to one town in Australia. And a town a couple of miles away from that town in Sicily will send nobody mm-hmm. because there is not the knowledge built up there. And so the knowledge builds up in this one little Sicilian town about this one little tiny part of Australia. And that's where the people go. When a group transfers its culture from where the culture may have evolved to a new host country, what's happening exactly? Is, is the assimilation process not working or is there some balance? Uh, now, that also differs from group to group. I mean, there are some groups that come over and within one generation they've uh, practically disappeared into the larger society. Germans are, have had a very tenacious culture. When I was doing research for this book, I, was, I remember walking through a graveyard in South Australia in which every gravestone was in German. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, you know, in the hotel you could buy the German language newspaper that was 100 years old. So, and of course they were brewing beer, needless to say. Uh, but uh, in other places they assimilate much faster. Well, what, what explains the remarkable persistence of some, some groups? No matter where they travel around the world, they seem to, to, to not only carry those cultural traits with them, but in some cases they're highly successful regardless of where they are. Well, well that, that, that's the great question. I'm still struggling to get people to admit that there are these patterns because the, the prevailing doctrine in social science is that the group is really the creature of the surrounding society, of the institutions and the biases and so forth. And so one of the key, uh, keynotes of the whole book and of my studies in general is that these groups have their own internal patterns. Mm-hmm. And you can see that very dramatically in many groups. You identify some groups that seem to be successful. Yes. No matter who are they? You mentioned Germans. Oh, the, 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 Ch- the overseas Chinese who are fascinating because the overseas Chinese are successful everywhere in the world. Ex- the Chinese are su- successful everywhere in the world except China. Mm-hmm. And you can also say of the Indians that by and large they are successful everywhere in the world except in India. Is that because in India they're culture-bound, for example? That's right. There, there are so many restrictions uh, on them. 
Uh, I remember an Indian businessman in California that's saying how he's visiting his son in Silicon Valley and he's trying to get him to come back to India. And the son won't go because uh, here he can move ahead on his own merit in India. They have more uh, quotas and preferences than we do and have had them longer. And he knows that if he's not with the right group, why then he's not going to go anywhere. And so he says, forget it. You'll stay here in Silicon Valley. Well, did you write this book because of today's immigration debate, or is it tied into... Oh, no. Uh, good heavens. I started this book in April 1982. Oh. So uh, <laughs> today's immigration debate was not the uppermost thing in my mind. Well, it, I assume you think it may have some influence on today's I would, I, I would hope so, um, because the situation, there are so many pluses and minuses, it's going to take some very serious thought to sort them all out. Uh, for example, uh, you know, the winning of World War II without having to land American troops uh, on the beaches of Japan, where they undoubtedly would have been slaughtered by the tens of thousands, uh, was made possible solely by immigrants who came over here and, and, and created the American atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the American space program and the Russian space program are both due to the German uh, rocket sciences. Uh, you can run down the whole list of things that have been created, the garment industry in the United States and many other countries created by Jews and so on. So and yet, yet you see the, the modern transportation today, uh, and the modern communication, I guess, is having less impact on the transfer of human capital. It, the, the, the movement of people itself may not be as important. Exactly. That, that, that is now you can transfer the human capital, you know, by multinational corporations, uh, by the internet, by uh, sending people abroad to be educated. Uh, the bulk, most of the people who receive PhDs in engineering in the United States today are not Americans. A lot of people don't like that. <laughs> that that's right. Uh, Amer Americans don't have the education in many cases to, to uh, stand up to that kind of rigorous work. Well, we should explore that after this just going to pause for a moment and kindly ask you to please give this video a thumbs up, hit that notification bell, please subscribe and share these out so others can enjoy them. Thank you so much. Um, in your book, you note that some immigrant groups seem to have these persistent traits that uh, no matter where they go, they seem to have them. Mm -hmm. um, why does that happen? And, and in a culture like ours where we're pushing assimilation, couldn't that interfere with that process? Well, I think the groups that uh, have a full range of skills, they have businessmen, they have uh, workers, they have the whole range, uh, they can have their own little enclaves. And in fact, the Germans and the Jews at one time ha had that kind of sy system. Uh, you could live on the Lower East Side of New York and you have your own doctors, your own businessmen, your own stores, everything, uh, speaking Yiddish every day without a word of English, and go on and live a lifetime that way. Is that good? I mean, is that well, it has its pluses and minuses. But if you have a group that is mostly unskilled workers, mm -hmm. then they have to work for somebody else, and they have to be able to un understand somebody else's language, and so it's crucial for them to acquire, to acquire the Americans, culture. Most Americans, I know most of the viewers out there, you would want uh, immigrants to speak English. Uh, most uh, most of the immigrants themselves want to speak English. What, the reason there's a controversy is that you have many activists, both from within the group and people in the larger society, who want to keep them foreign. But most of the, most of the immigrants themselves want to become Americans. Self-appointed do-gooders. Oh, you, you, you got it. I want to talk more about that. But let's talk to Dirk in uh, Navasota, Texas. Thanks for calling Borderline. Hello, yes. I have a question for Mr. Sowell. Shoot. Uh, Mr. Sowell, I live in Germany, and I've, I went there 10 years ago, and I'm an American. And when the borders fell in Berlin and we let East Germany be a part of West Germany, now we're all one, uh, we realize something that is basically happening with Mexico here in America. And my question is, uh, because of Yugoslavia and all of the other countries that are infiltrating into Germany, don't you think uh, there's a lot more land here in America, and why the greed? You, you lost me about greed. Well, I think um, what I'm trying to say is, if we're a land that in God we trust, and Jesus says, let the children come to me, wouldn't you agree that we need to open our arms to Mexico? No, because uh, every country has to protect its own borders. There was a time when every, virtually every country in the Western Hemisphere uh, not only allowed but encouraged immigration on a massive scale because they had the land and they needed the resources and so on. Uh, it's not at all clear that if you were to throw the borders wide open and let anyone come who wants to, that this would still be the same country 50 years from now. And so, uh, in a sense, you can't let everybody come to America, because if everybody came to America, it wouldn't be America anymore. So that, that's not an option that we have. 
Uh, the most we can do is try to weigh many very different kinds of considerations. Well, judging from the success of various groups in your book, who should come to America? How should we decide? Oh, I, I'm, th th that's a much tougher one. But I think that uh, we should say that we do have the right to decide. And if people who come here from country X do well and make America a better place, then let more people come here from country X. And if people who come from country Y simply come here and uh, become a burden on the American taxpayers, then less people should come from a country Y. One of the problems that we have uh, is that the welfare state makes it very expensive to let immigrants in. So you have a, you have a country like uh, New Zealand, whose total population uh, is less than that of New York City. You know, and, and they have all kinds of barriers against immigrants. Uh, you know, they've got 60 million sheep there and 3 million people, yeah. uh, and, and vast amounts of empty land. But the point is, once you put your foot on New Zealand soil, you're entitled to all kinds of benefits at the expense of the taxpayers, and therefore the taxpayers don't want you. So it's not just a question of the uh, number of people on the land, it's a question of what kind of system do you have. And one of Germany's problems, one of the reasons of, for the great hostility to immigration in Germany, is that they are a welfare state. If this was a place where you, sh you come in and it's up to you to support yourself, I suspect you'd have a lot less res resistance, resistance to immigration. Okay, let's talk to Paul in Springfield. Paul, thanks for calling. Thank you. Dr. Soule, um, I'm a big fan of yours, and I uh, urge you to keep up the good work. You've just, uh, you're, uh, really uh, think a lot of you. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, I, I guess I have, have, have one premise, and um, then I guess um, maybe two premises here. I, I think that it's important that, that for the sake of our national identity and, and, and for, for public policy reasons, I think that, that, that immigrants um, largely assimilate. They learn to speak the language, they learn the bourgeois work ethic and these sorts of things. And, and, and I guess um, kind of is, 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 is proof of, 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 of that is that um, <clears throat> before we had this huge welfare safety net, um, immigrants who came here had to learn those sorts of things, and there seemed to be, um, they seemed to be a, a, a absorbed into, into American society uh, quicker simply because of necessity. They had to become one of, one of us, mm -hmm. so to say. And I would just you know, like your comments on that. Oh, absolutely. No, 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 no question about it. Uh, there, while some groups did retain their uh, languages and customs and so on, well, even the Germans eventually began to speak English. And once, once the younger generation came along and learned English, why then the whole group over time very quickly became assimilated. Uh, but again, it, it is the welfare state, and it's more than that, it's the so-called multiculturalism, which is really encouraging people to paint themselves into their own little corners and try to make it on their own. And that, that, that is one of the most horrible thoughts to me, because if there's one thing I've learned from the, all the years I've spent doing the research for this book, uh, it is that every nation, every great civilization has borrowed heavily from the rest of the world. Uh, I mean, the, the very paper that we use, you know, was invented in China. The letters were a, a Latin. Uh, the numbers came from India. <laughs> you know, you, you go through the whole list there. And what you're saying to, to various people is, you're to be off in your own little world, and make it all on your own. And I, I just don't think that can, that can be done. No one's done it so far. Okay, when we come back, we remember we wanna hear from you. Should immigrants be allowed to stay in enclaves if it makes them less competitive, more competitive? What do you think about that and multiculturalism? Give us a call, 1-800-5000-NET. Thomas Sowell, I'm Dan Stein, we'll be right back. We're back with more of your calls. I got one quick question, though. You make the point that some groups, uh, Germans, uh, ethnic Chinese, uh, Jews in the diaspora, I mean, they do very well no matter where they go. If they assimilate in the host country, then they disappear. Why would we want them to assimilate if they if they're yeah, doing very, well? Very, very good point. They, they, they assimilate, and particularly the younger generation, in things like language, uh, dress, things of that sort, really in a sense superficially. Mm -hmm. The values that uh, make them successful, they tend to keep those values. Uh, and, and I think that, that that only enriches the country. So many of those values are, are what, 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 what many people would call traditional American values that many Americans are losing. Mm -hmm. But the host country has a right to expect immigrants, if you will, to learn the language, to yes. dress in the national culture, and to assimilate to that extent. And, and, the, and the outward thing, certainly. Okay, let's talk to Diana in Great Falls, a first-time caller. Thanks for calling. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Sewell, uh, one thing I, I wanted to ask you about, I actually have two questions. 
uh, I have been really surprised that more black leaders have not spoken up uh, because basically it seems to me that it's the black people who have lost the most through job opportunities uh, with this unlimited immigration. I'll give you an example. I noticed this under the Carter administration back when I used to be a waitress in a restaurant. And we'd have a job opening and we'd get 50 calls from, from Washington, D.C., from black people, you know, who wanted the jobs. And the, the management of the, the restaurant would end up hiring an illegal Mexican to do the work. And I thought this was terrible, whereas before the blacks were always getting those jobs uh, in restaurants and things. This has been, now you've got Indians, Pakistanis, all these different people have taken these jobs over and has pushed the blacks more and more into this basically a ghetto existence, except for the few, the minority, who've been able to get out has pushed them further into drugs and everything else. This should have been their chance, that, you know, with the, uh, the equal opportunity and everything, to get up the ladder and to really assimilate into the population. It really hasn't happened. My other question, I spent a lot of time in uh, Central America, particularly in the Caribbean Basin, and all the blacks up there are immigrating into the United States. And what really shocked me is how quickly they rise up the economic ladder, very quickly become own their own homes and become middle class. All right, let's get a response. Well, I guess the, the first one, um, in some particular cases, which what you say may be true, but there have been studies done uh, of uh, places where there's a heavy Mexican immigration, for example. And the un unemployment rate among blacks in those areas tends to be lower than it is elsewhere. There's not some fixed number of jobs from which the immigrants, you know, you subtract the number that go to the immigrants. Uh, the immigrants themselves create jobs, both uh, when they're employers and simply by the fact that they increase the, uh, the national output, which increases the demand and therefore increases the demand for labor. So uh, it's not at all clear to me that the immigrants take the jobs away. What may happen in many cases, however, and in many countries, uh, is that the immigrants, because they come in, and particularly at the bottom level jobs, they prevent the wages from rising enough in those jobs to wean people away from the welfare state benefits. And so therefore we end up uh, su supporting native, more Native Americans because of the immigrants. We may not be supporting the immigrants directly, but they will prevent the, the, uh, the wages well, from all, rising. All of us have seen examples, though, of where we see an immigrant who doesn't speak very good English, and they've mm -hmm. got a PhD, mm -hmm. but they just got here, and they, they know eventually maybe they're going to make their way into, say, the engineering field. But in the meantime, they're going to wait tables. Yes. Because they know that it's only temporary, two or three years, mm. they're willing to work all day for a bucket of fish heads, basically. Yes. They're willing to work for no pay. Now, I mean, clearly, so for you have, you have Americans who are just, they're not destined to go to college, or they're not destined to, 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 get, to go into the t technical fields for whatever reason. Doesn't, doesn't the influx of that labor pool that's willing to compete on those terms erode the bargaining leverage of Americans who, in a sense, are looking to live a, you know, a decent life well, for if, 30 if years they, if working they, if in they, less skilled if they, if they plan to work all their lives at minimum wage jobs, which nobody does okay. hardly, uh, yes. But the very same things that allows the immigrant to start off, as many of the Cubans did, you know, shining shoes and moving right. on up, will allow other people to start off shining shoes and move on up. Freedom means inequality by definition, yes. right? Okay. All right, we got a lot of calls, and we'll get back to them right after this uh, word from our sponsors, Borderline. Be right back. We're back with Thomas Sowell and more of your calls. Let's go right to Edmund, first-time caller from Fort Myers, Florida. Yeah, hi. What was the first question? Should we permit more immigrants? What was that? What's the question? Yeah. More immigrants? Well, how should we select immigrants? If we're going to take them, who should they be? My subject, uh, we should, for sure we should take more immigrants in, but the right educated ones. I do have my uh, son-in-law, his wife, and his son. They wanted to come to the United States, and they're highly educated. My son-in-law teach at the time on the universities in Germany. So he would not take a job, he would somebody who create jobs. So those should come in, and all the papers are ready, but because of the changing of the rules in 1964, the immigration rules, he is now on a wasting list and has to wait three years until he would be in line. Well, if we have those policies, that would not help us. 
See, after World War II in 1952, uh, yeah, there was a big exodus from Germany to the United States. Everybody skilled who came here brought this country up, and that vanished when we changed the immigration laws in 1964 for and being just the great society what was pronounced at that time. So then everybody, we had to be just, everybody could come in. Well, more or less, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the immigration from Germany dried up anyway because Germany uh, had now enough work for their own people there. But uh, uh, still, my son-in-law is willing to come. He will be here in the next four weeks anyway on a university in uh, Blackburg, Virginia. So he, uh, by NATO, he comes over here once in a while, and uh, so they uh, make research. But he was still willing to come over here and lend his his uh, capability to United States. His okay. wife, his wife speaks four languages. His the boy is in German high school, speaks already three four languages himself. So there should be something done. All right, thanks, Edmund. I, uh, I think he raises an important point, which is that in 1965, Congress put in place a law that selects now not on the basis of what you know, but, but who you know. And 80% yes. of the immigrants come just because they have a relative came earlier. And, and that seems to create this reinforcing pattern of immigrants coming uh, from the same uh, country. Uh, What's uh, the and, 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 and it reinforces the culture. It prevents the people from uh, learning to speak English, having to learn to speak English. But this happens all over the world when, when you have this continuous movement of people in. What happened after the restrictions of the 1920s in the United States was that millions of people who are, had all the foreign languages and ways slowly began to assimilate, usually with the younger people first and so on. So that by about 1940, uh, you no longer had this vast number of people with foreign ways in the United States. Well, the 21 law also brought the numbers down, too, right? It brought, uh, oh, yeah, it brought the numbers way, way, way down. Well, now with the, you have the immigrant overload in these various communities, then you have the multiculturalism template over that. Yes. Is that, is that a threat uh, of some kind? Yes, and because it, it, it systematically tries to keep foreign people foreign, even when they, uh, in the case of children, their parents, want them to become American. Let's so. talk to Howard in Howard in Cedar Falls, Illinois, Iowa. Howard, thanks for calling. It seems like everybody understands this problem except the people in the government. The government says drugs is the number one problem. But I hate to tell these people, but you give it a few more years, immigration is going to be the number one problem. We're being invaded right now. You can go to parts of Iowa, and it, you go into stores, and they're not speaking English anymore. The reason is is because of so many Mexicans here. This is getting ridiculous. This is the United States. If these people want to come here, fine. You've, met, you've set uh, standards to where they have to learn English, they have to become American, and that they have to take and be able to support themselves. And they shouldn't be allowed in the country at all if they don't have a sponsor. Hello. All right, thanks, Howard. What, what are some of, the, of, the, of the, the threats which I think Americans are feeling now? I mean, but you identify in your book some of the threats that can come about. Oh, yeah, well, uh, I, think, I think the mere fact that uh, so much of what was once Mexico is now the southwestern United States is due to the fact that all the Americans settled in Mexico as immigrants, uh, pledged to become part of the Mexican scheme of life, and after a while decided they didn't want to do that. And therefore, they took, took themselves and the land and joined it to the United States. So this can happen. Uh, you can have immigrants in such large numbers that they become a threat to the system themselves. Of course, the Roman Empire had that problem when the barbarians settled. Was well, that happening in California now? I mean, we're, we have some we have Mexican immigration coming in, mm -hmm. bilingual education. Oh yes. Uh, you know, uh, long-term bilingual ballots. Talk about non-citizen oh, yes. voting in San Francisco now. Uh, the Mexican government is becoming increasingly active in asserting sort of. Yes. Mexican, I mean, is, are we beginning to see? Yeah, some, I, some I, kind I think of the a tragedy is that uh, that. Uh, inst a lot of the immigrants, of course, come in illegally, which means we have no control whatsoever over, over what kind of people come in, other than those who are willing to come in. Well, what shocks me is that people who try to cross that border and are caught are turned loose scot-free to try two or three more times that week. Meanwhile, you're cracking down on businessmen who are trying to run a business, and you're trying to recruit them as law enforcement agents for, to enforce laws that the in, in, Immigration and Naturalization Service is not enforcing. 
Well, what, what should it mean? What, who, who should determine whether someone's legal or not legal in the United States? Just the Federal Immigration Service? Yes, and I think, I think well, what, you, what you need is to get away from squeamishness. I can't believe that you couldn't stop this immigration from Mexico, for example. If you, if you dug uh, uh, trenches five feet deep in the earth and filled them with concrete so that nobody could, uh, you know... Uh, you afraid tunnel. of the national ID card? I'm afraid of what it would be used for. Mm. But, I, but I, I hate to see a, a problem dealt with, not by, attack, not by attacking those who create the problem, but by attacking vast numbers of other people who have nothing really to do with that problem. Uh, I'm afraid what would be done with a national ID card. But if you, had, if you had fences that went five feet into the ground and 10 feet above the ground and barbed wire on the top, I suspect we'd get just a few high-jumping athletes uh, coming into the United States. Okay. We're back with more of your calls. We've got Tom in Columbia, Crossroads, Pennsylvania. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Soule, I uh, am a retired uh, New York State government employee. I worked for the Office of Mental Health and Retardation. I began uh, working uh, in retardation, and um, one observation that I noticed is, is that uh, if you look at the numbers of people in there, there were two major reasons we had uh, the retardation population we had. One was due to alcoholism. The other was due to inbreeding. Mm. I'm not going to name the groups because that's, that would not be correct to do. But they are people who refuse to assimilate in the general society, so therefore they do not marry outside of the... I'm not saying they're, they're incestuous or anything. Mm, I'm sure. saying that they're just very, very closed group. Uh, that's one observation. The other is is that again, I noticed uh, later later on I went on to work in a psychiatric uh, hospital with the uh, uh, assaulted patients, but I noticed that we had people, lots of doctors from all over the world, and uh, I remember there was a couple, Hindu couple. The doctor, uh, the the husband walked in front, or the wife walked in back of the husband in her traditional Hindu garb. When I worked in retardation, we had a chief of service who was Hindu, wore her Hindu garb, and we had a head nurse who was her uh, inferior in terms of, of her employment position, uh, who was Christian. And there was a little friction there because the Christian considered that she was freer and uh, more advanced than the Hindu who was uh, in a position over her. I'd like to hear your comment on all that. Thank you. Well, of course, you're going to have these frictions between groups, whether they're all born here or they come from halfway around the world. So I'm not sure that that's really a decisive uh, uh, objection to, to, to immigration. Um, the inbreeding, I don't, I don't know um, what groups he has in mind, whether they're current groups or some some place back in history, because uh, when you have immigrants by the millions, uh, uh, you're likely to get a great deal more um, uh, interaction and, and not have that inbreeding problem. But I would assume that, uh, you know, groups which view themselves as, you know, cohesive and, and migrating and yet highly competitive mm -hmm. are going to feel, by definition, a strong social pressure to have their children intermarry within the group. That, that, that usually is the, the first generation or two. Uh, but 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 partly that's a language, a function of the language. As they uh, when they, when they're unable to speak the language, because the Jews were once concentrated wholly, almost wholly in the Lower East Side of New York, but um, immediately the next generation they were up in the into Harlem and the Bronx and then out to Chicago and Los Angeles and San Francisco and so on, and so you no longer had that kind of situation. Now, that that's a transient problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it would be a problem, if I assume, if they just <laughs> yeah. continue. Well, I, I can't think offhand of a group that's done that. All right, let's talk to Jean in Fairfax, a first-time caller, too. Thanks for calling. Uh, yes, first of all, Dr. Soule, is your crisis of vision still in print? Co conflict of visions? Conflict of vision. Yes, it is. Yeah, and where do we get that? Laissez Fair Books in San Francisco. Oh, we have that. All right, that's They have fine. an 800 number, which I don't remember. <laughs> all right, conflict of vision. In any case, do you think that, uh, that the school vouchers that are being proposed for some of the uh, inner city children would help to bring, you know, the immigrants as well as the other disadvantaged children into more of an American attitude or help them bring them up? I don't know. The, the voucher has a lot to recommend it simply because the public schools are so bad that it would be hard to come up with something that's worse. 
And so, and I think the competition would itself improve the public schools a lot. The fact that they have a monopoly is really the key to their mediocrity. Well, how, but, but how, I mean, how well can the children of immigrants be expected to do with such a high rate, given what's happening in American public education? Now, if you look at the children of immigrants 30 years ago, they seem to be doing fairly well. But mm -hmm. if you look at the, today's children of immigrants, they're highly concentrated in the, you know, in Los Angeles, mm. uh, Unified School District, and uh, in parts of Texas, Miami. They're not getting the kind of education, I would think, that would enable them to, to compete. Is, is that not true? I don't know, because uh, somehow or other the Asians come over and they seem, they, say, they seem to get the education and, and to compete. Mm -hmm. uh, the Indians, are uh, people from India living in the United States have higher uh, incomes than the average Americans. So somehow it can be done. Uh, I have a friend who's in, living in a neighborhood where his kids are predominantly Asian, and his, his main concern is that his kids can have trouble keeping up. But he's happy that they're going to raise the standards so that if his kid gets C's, he will still have a better education than, than kids who are getting A's and B's in some of the other schools you elsewhere. You mentioned the anointed in your mm -hmm. book over and over again. The yeah. anointed yes. don't do a service to the immigrants. Who are the anointed? These are the people who think that it is their job to make other people's decisions for them, who believe either directly or through the government, uh, the liberal establishment, much of the media, the people who think that the, they ought to be prescribing community service for students and things of that sort. What, what motivates them? I mean, why are they there? Is it a oh, I think ego, perhaps. Uh -huh. That uh, there a disproportionate number of them come from elite. Do they understand uh, how wealth is created? Do you think? No, they have no interest in that. They, they think that wealth is created somehow, and the only interesting question is how they can use their superior wisdom to redistribute it. Nice. Okay, let's talk to Rosie O in Fort Myers, Florida. Thanks for calling. Yes. Good evening. Um, my name is Rocio, and I came from Mexico in 81. I came with the idea of wanting to integrate myself to the American society. I, I knew some English when I came here, and I have never lived off welfare. I have always lived a productive life. I got married in 1984, and then I stopped working to raise my four children. The problem that I have had is that when I listen to people that says, well, in this case, Mexicans should act like that, should dress like that. I am in a position that I have always tried myself to integrate to the society. And reality is that no matter what you do, no matter what you accomplish, people will always put that barrier in front of you and they will not let you come in. So whenever I, I hear that they said, oh, but they like to live in, in their ghettos, speak in their languages, that is not true because I'm a, a, a living proof of that. And of course, when it comes to people living off welfare, it makes me upset when even Mexicans, my own race, do that because I'm, I'm working for that and I'm paying taxes. But on the other hand, it is very sad that one day my children could listen a negative comment about uh, his mother's um, race just because the fact that she is Mexican. And so how do you deal with that? Okay. I don't know, but I, I must say that the living in California for more than 20 years, uh, I have never seen a Mexican-American begging on the streets. Uh, people uh, tell me that the people on the streets you know, have misfortunes, and I say, do no misfortunes ever fall upon Mexican-Americans? Because they never go out in the streets and beg. Uh, they work. And I, I, don't, I don't think that there is this tremendously negative uh, picture of Mexican-Americans. I think that, again, the activists are pushing for the bilingualism and whatnot. And in fact, the activists make it a point to minimize the input of the, of the mothers and fathers uh, on, on school decision making, because if you leave it up to the parents, the Mexican-American parents will say, teach the kid English. But you know, yeah, I, I see your point. And I, I, of course, I see your point. Uh, but now, if you have this big influx of immigrants, mm. and for whatever reason, let's say our economic system isn't promoting their income advance to the level that the self-appointed, the anointed expect. And we saw with the New Deal, after the Depression hit, the anointed decided that because the immigrants weren't doing very well, we had to mandate equality through oh, the coercive yes. use of the federal government with the New Deal. Mm. Isn't there some danger with uh, you know, 20, 30 million immigrants coming in that we're beginning to see uh, you know, a, a huge new swath of unskilled labor in this country that, that even though the immigrants may not be begging, you may not mm -hmm, see yeah. the immigrants begging, that the anointed will in time use oh, their, no their question. status well, to, to well, push I, I think I think a major part of, inter of immigration problems are caused by people in the United States who use the immigrants uh, for, for their ideological purposes. Um, there's no question about that. Okay. 
Well, we'll have to take a break. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. And we also want to know what you think. Give us a call with your comments. 1-800-5000-NET. Please give us a call. Borderline will be right back. I think. We're back with more of your calls on Borderline. Let me take this uh, quick fax. Let me ask you this. It's from uh, Judy in Reston. Um, she makes the point that isn't it because of true because of welfare, uh, and I and I would I, I would add affirmative action that today's immigrants have a lot less at risk or at stake yes. than maybe our ancestors immigrants yes hundred years ago yes uh, also because of the of the nearness of many of the homeland you see when you had to cross the Atlantic Ocean especially in an era when when ships were sinking in the Atlantic yeah. uh, you had to really want to cross that ocean and you weren't planning to go back anytime soon. Whereas if you can pop back and forth across the border to Mexico or to fly out to the Caribbean and back, then your commitment becomes much more ambiguous. See. The other problem is with affirmative action, that you have people coming, uh, coming into the United States who are immediately entitled to uh, uh, set asides, uh, presumably to compensate for what happened to their ancestors who were never in the United States. That's, <laughs> that's why a lot of Americans in California are reacting negatively to affirmative action. Absolutely. You get right off the boat and you get a leg up. Well, and you have guys who come in with vast amounts of money, set up their own companies in Silicon Valley, and are entitled to preferential access to government contracts. Okay, let's talk to Rich and Coral. Gables, Florida. Rich, uh, can you make it quick? Yes. Uh, sure, my huh. question was a uh, migration of sorts but within the United States. Uh, I came from Appalachian Mountains in eastern Kentucky 14 years ago, and a lot of people consider those people uneducated. And I went to college, became a paramedic firefighter, and I've been in Florida the last 14 years. And that's my comment. My question was, I heard you on the radio show last week, Dr. Soul, uh -huh. and it was about, uh, you originally said you were a Marxist, and then you became a conservative. Uh, oh, uh, yes. I wonder what influenced you to become a conservative. Uh, working for the government. Really? Yes. That's, that's what con convinced Milton Friedman, by the way. He was a liberal before he worked for the government. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well, why, why, well, why do you, I mean, what do you, what do you, do you think, why, do you think that the, uh, the ideology uh, of, of the free movement of labor uh, as it relates to immigration is picking up steam in this, uh, you know, in the Congress with the Republicans in charge? I don't know, because the, uh, the, these things go back and forth. The conservatives are split on this. The libertarians are, are gung-ho for, for it all. Well, you know, well, what about this? I mean, the, the libertarians don't think there should be any borders at all, right? That's right. That's right. Well, they Peter, don't think there should be any government, so therefore there necessarily wouldn't be any, any borders. So well, where's, I, that's the, where's the balance? Do you want to preserve your national culture? And your you you have to. Otherwise, uh, they, they would, I mean, the, the immigrants are coming here because of something they find here that they don't find in their own homeland. Obviously, if you allow this to become just like their homeland, there won't be any benefit to them, and it'll be a tremendous loss to the people who are already here. I, I see. Well, in, in terms of how the policy is being made in Congress today, if you follow the debates, is that being considered in the process? All sorts of things are being considered, including uh, uh, you know, the slogans of the moment. Uh -huh. Well, I noticed you cite in your book Peter Brimlow's book, yes. Alien Nation, with mm -hmm. some heat. Now, he makes the point that the rapid ethnic change going on through immigration is unprecedented in American history. Uh, that may be. I, I, I take that much less seriously than he does. And more importantly, I think the American people take it much less seriously than he does. Oh. I, I don't find the great hostility, for example, to Chinese and Japanese Americans uh, in, in this country that there once was. Japanese Americans. Yes. Well, but he raises some points that I think you agree with, right? That the yeah, because that that in in much of the literature they don't want to admit that there are any problems created by immigrants, but of course there are problems. The, the mere differentness of people will create problems, and if there is hostility, then of course you don't need higher levels of hostility in the society, whether or not the hostility is justified. Uh -huh. Do you think it is today? Justified the hostility that's grown. <laughs> It's misdirected. It, there should be hostility toward those who are promoting multiculturalism and the, the welfare state. Okay. The book is Migration and Cultures. Migrations and Cultures, a World View, by Thomas Sowell. To the memory of Carter Goodrich, who made economic and social history come alive to a young graduate student. Preface. This book about the odysseys of peoples has had odysseys of its own. Evolving over a period of more than a dozen years, it has ended up being very different from what it was conceived to be at the outset in 1982, or what it was at various stages along the way. For example, what was conceived of as a single book has ended up as three thus far. Race and Culture, published in 1994, was originally the last quarter of a huge manuscript of the same name, 
which included the histories now published here separately. Another spin-off was a study of affirmative action programs around the world, entitled Preferential Policies, an International Perspective, published in 1991. This has been an odyssey for the author as well, not only an odyssey of the mind, but also a series of journeys that took me to fifteen countries on four continents, some of these countries being visited two or three times over the years. Much of the data, literature, and expertise available in these countries was invaluable and virtually impossible to get while staying at home. Seeing the many peoples themselves, and their clearly very different ways and paces of working, often made their economic differences something that required no esoteric or sinister theories to explain. History can be cruel to theories, as it has been cruel to peoples. Examples of both should be apparent in the chapters that follow. But history is what happened, not what we wish had happened, or what a theory says should have happened. History cannot be prettified in the interests of promoting acceptance or mutual respect among peoples and cultures. There is much in the history of every people that does not deserve respect. Whether with individuals or with groups, respect is something earned, not a door prize handed out to all. It cannot be prescribed by third parties, for what is to be respected depends on each individual's own values or the social values accepted by that individual, and equal respect is an internally contradictory evasion. If everything is respected equally, then the term respect has lost its meaning. There is no way to begin honestly and know how the study of history will end, either as regards mutual respect among peoples or anything else. This book itself did not end up as planned, but turned instead into three very different books, each changing in content and conclusions with the passing years. Meanwhile, parts of the early manuscript dealing with multi-ethnic societies simply disappeared into oblivion as I realized that a study of multi-ethnic societies was a much bigger project than originally envisaged, and therefore one appropriate to a much younger man. The purpose of this book is, quite simply, that we should know what we are talking about when we talk about peoples and their cultures. That is a very large task in itself. Thomas Sowell, The Hoover Institution in the description, I have some referral links for products I use myself. There's one for the American Express Amazon Prime card. Immediately upon approval, you get $125 deposited into your Amazon account. You don't have to spend $1 on the card. It is the best deal out there. If you haven't already, please check out and install the Brave browser. It is the best for speed, compatibility, and privacy. If you're using it already, go ahead and hit that triangle up in the corner, and it's a great way to show your support for this channel. You can also earn basic attention tokens when you use Brave, which you can convert to Bitcoin, US dollars, whatever you want. It's a great way for you to earn the ad revenue instead of the other guys. Thanks again so much. I really appreciate all the support. Take care.